Okay, here we go again. Um, I put chapters four and five on the last one. So we are on to chapter six and seven. I'm gonna do two because they're about seven and a half minutes a piece. So that will mean that uh, the time that you get in class, you'll be able to watch it. Okay, so this is chapter six, seven. Let's go, where am I going? Right here. Okay, so Chad, Sarah's brother and his friend have taken off. They're gonna go fight for the Patriots against Britain. They prayed for them. Dad wasn't happy, he cuffed uh, Chad about it. They seemed a little drunk. They signed up to go. They'd been reading Common Sense, which is a famous uh, paper uh, by, or book paper by Thomas Paine um that spelled out all the stuff they were really 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 good writers then and of course it's kind of old english so it's hard for kids to understand but here we go let's let's see what happens to chad also uh there's a mr wentworth and the lady that her uh, sarah's dad was fixing her clock she has an injury on her hand and there was blood on the handkerchief so we're wondering what's going on with that too um and there were a lot of ties to what's going on in society today with regard to what's being taught in schools and parents are not happy about that. Um, and uh, if you're, you know, uh, <laughs> using the vaccinations and the maskers, right? Or if you were for Trump or not for Trump, I mean, the country's very divided. Um, and people just aren't happy and they weren't happy then either. So let's see what happens. On to chapter six. For two whole weeks, nothing was heard about the stolen horses. Oh yeah, and the, they came out of church and six families have lost their horses. So thieves were about. For two whole weeks, nothing was heard about the stolen horses. Then Mr. Kincaid carted a load of early apples over to Newton. While he was there, he heard that a drover had been seen hurrying east just the day before. Not sure what a drover is. Driving 12 horses, that was all we ever heard. Maybe a drover is some kind of a cart, I'm not sure. Father did not have the money for another team, but he sold some tools and managed to buy one horse, a mare. She wasn't much of a horse. She was a spa fiend, and at least as old as I. I'm not sure what a spa fiend is either. However, she could pull a wagon if it was not loaded full. No one knew her name, so I called her Samantha because I liked the sound. We started harvesting the corn three days after our team was stolen. It was beautiful corn, um, mostly four ears to the stock, plump and the color of fresh butter. I took three half loads to Purdy's mill and had them ground into meal. I paid Mr. Purdy what we owed and had some left for winter. I caught only a glimpse of Quorum's bony head sticking up above a stack of barrels and his small, mean little eyes peering down at me. Mr. Purdy told me about the cat he had shot how it had left a trail of blood behind, how afterward the mill hadn't stopped at midnight. I didn't tell him about old lady Ryder and her hand. Oh, so it was old lady Ryder. I suppose you put that together before me. Oh, she was the one stopping the mill for some reason. Ooh, the plot thickens. The next week we picked a few early Roxbury russets. Russets are potatoes, which always go to a good market. They're not a pretty apple. Oh, I guess they're not potatoes they're a type of apple i stand corrected they are not a pretty apple having sort of a brownish blush maybe like a potato but underneath the blush is a green gold and the flesh is sweet and crisp we also had a fine crop of golden russets coming on it is a smaller apple than the roxbury but richer to the taste wow whenever i hear russet i'm thinking russet potatoes so it's interesting to find out that apples are named russets as well I put up 10 gallons of cider, 33 jugs of apple butter, and saved three small barrels to dry for winter eating. Some I told and sold in Mott's Corner, going from house to house because you get more money that way than if you sell them to the store. When I was no longer tired at night, father brought out the Bible after supper, and we sat at the table and he read to me. I'd had a lot of religious instruction from the Bible since the time I was old enough to listen to the, so this was more to help me to speak and write properly now that I was not going to school anymore. I'd given up the idea because father was set against it. Oh, darn. Father was an admirer of William Tyndale. He never got tired of talking about him. Every night he told me something new about Tyndale. Imagine, he said one night, it was the night Birdsall mob, Birdsall's mob came to our place. Imagine a young man just out of the university who wished to translate the Bible from the Greek language to 
in which it was first written into English, but he couldn't because it was against the wishes of Henry VIII. He is the king who had many wives and cut the heads off two of them because his life was in danger. Tyndale had to leave England and flee to Germany. There he translated the Bible, printed it, and smuggled it down the Rhine River into England, though the king's spies were on his trail. My father leaned across the table. He clasped his hands. His eyes shone steady in the candlelight. I could imagine him living long ago, having the courage to do the things William Tyndale did. Afterwards, because the king's spies were searching everywhere for him, he hid out in cellars and garrets and cocklofts. He hid for many years in fear of his life, but all the while writing words in praise of Christ until he was finally captured, strangled, and burned at the stake. Yikes. Today, Sarah, most of the words I read to you are of Tyndale's making. Listen to Matthew. Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek Turn to him the other also. And this ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Ah, be kind, be kind, be kind to others, no matter if they're evil or not, right? Resist the urge to take an eye when one eye has been taken. Um, I think those are just good words. Father closed the Bible and folded his hands on the table. It is good in stressful times to hear the music of these words, to let it echo in the heart. But the meanings are something else besides. It is terribly hard for me to remember them when I think of the quarm or Purdy or Ben Birdsall. Could it be that I am not a Christian? You are a Christian, I said. Are you, Sarah? Can you find it in your heart to forgive Birdsall and his mob? I find it hard. Father opened the Bible again and began to read from Kings. When from far off in the direction of Purdy's mill, we heard the sound of hoofs striking stone. Father put the Bible away. He went to the door and listened and came back and blew out the candle. The sound of hoofs came closer. From the window, I saw a line of horsemen against the sky. They were riding at a trot down the winding road toward our house. I heard the horses splash through the stream. Father took up the old musket that he had used for hunting waterfowl, the one Chad had asked for. He opened the door a crack and stood listening for a moment. Then he closed the door and bolted it. I was standing back from the window watching. There were 10 horsemen. They rode up near the barn and sat there waiting while one of them slid from the saddle and came to the door. He held a torch in his hand. By its light, I recognized Ben Birdsall, his head and his fat little neck thrust out. Open up, he said and rapped twice. What do you want? Father asked. I want to talk, came the reply, and I can't do it through the door. It was dark in the room except for a thread of light where birds all torch shone through. Father shouldered his musket, slid the bolt, and opened the door. I stood back of him. Birds all held the torch up to see better. He was not carrying a gun, but he had a nose that was turned up in such a way that you peered right in. It must be a nostril. Come on. Whoa. My. Oh. Where am I? Uh, to his nostrils. In the torchlight, they looked like the barrels of two pistols. Light the candle, Sarah, my father said. We don't need light, Birdsall answered. He held the torch higher and waved it. I understand that you have a picture of King George hanging on your wall. I did have. It is there no longer. That's good to hear, said Birdsall. The cows were restless, moving around in the barn, and one of them bawled. You know David Whitlock, do you not? Birdsall said. Father nodded. He's a friend of my son. Why do you ask? Young Whitlock reported to his father, who reported to me that you took a book belonging to his father, to said father, a book by Thomas Paine called Common Sense. Uh-oh. Did willfully tear this book up and did, without proper cause, scatter the pieces about in an angry manner. Why, may I ask? He sounded as if he were reading from a paper like David himself. It was not a book, father said in an, in an even voice. It was a pamphlet, and I destroyed... One or the other, it's no matter, birds all broke in. What was the reason for such high-handedness? Do you ask me honestly? I do. Well, Colonel Birdsall, my answer is that the pamphlet is a pack of lies. I was shocked by my father's blunt words, for he gained nothing by saying them. My brother Chad joined the militia, I said. He's a patriot soldier. Father was too proud and unbending never to say this. Chad is off somewhere fighting now. 
Birdsall said nothing. He acted as if Chad's being a soldier with the Patriot militia made no difference to him. His torch began to smoke and he held it out at arm's length, but its light still glinted up his upturned nose. It still looked like two black pistol barrels pointed straight at us. The horsemen seemed to catch a signal from Ben Birdsall for something. They began to ride around in a circle. One of them lit a torch. Uh Uh-oh. The man held it while it sputtered and burst into flame. Then he flung it into a hay mow uh, beside the barn. Oh, flames leaped high and caught the barn roof and licked their way swiftly upward to the ridge pole. Can you believe it? They're going to burn down their barn. And that means the cows and everything. I was unable to move or think. I stood there staring at the flames and screaming at birds all. I have no idea what I said. Then I ran past him thinking to lead the cows out of the milking shed. I had taken no more than a dozen steps when the old mare staggered out of the barn. Her throat had been cut and she fell sprawling at my feet. Oh my someone seized me from behind others bound my arms and legs they pulled me off away from the barn in the house which was now also burning they tied me to the trunk of a tree and left one of them was quarm oh the horse in the barn and the cow shed and the pigsty were now one mass of sparks and leaping flames i heard strange sounds men yelling at each other and laughter when the moon came up i worked myself free from the tree I heard a wagon drive away. I heard horsemen galloping off up the hill. I kept moving through the grass toward our house, which was now only smoldering. I called out with all the strength I had left. A figure came toward me out of the leaping shadows through the trees across the meadow. It was like a figure you set up in a field to scare away crows, but it was not such a figure. It was my father with his arms stretched out toward me. He was covered with tar and feathers. They looked like the same feathers that had I had used to make our sleeping pillows. Oh my God, that's the end of chapter six. I don't know if you know this, but the Patriots would tar and feather people who supported the British. Her father was one of them. Chapter seven. A few people had come to see the fire burn, our house and all the outbuildings. Most of them just stood around and watched, fearful of birds on his gang. Only Mrs. Jessup helped, helped us. She was a widow woman who lived down the road two miles away. She came toward the last with her two strapping sons. After Birdsall had gone and they lifted father into their wagon, she was known as a neutral, not caring much whether the Patriots won or those who were loyal to the king. So she was willing to take us in. Besides, she was a Christian woman. As we drove into the Jessup's, there was only a faint glow against the sky to mark where the house had been. A wind came up. A wind had come up. It smelled of bitter smoke. The boys carried father inside and laid him on the floor in front of the fireplace. His hair hung down in dirty black strings. His nose and ears were stopped by great smears of tar. Birdsall's mob had stripped him down to his small clothes, which are underwear, and tarred all his body, even daubed tar between his toes. Then they had strewn feathers so thick that he looked like some monstrous fowl that had come from the devil's hen coop. Mrs. Jessup sent the boys into the cellar for a barrel of lard, which we rubbed into the tar. We used up the barrel, half of another barrel, on three big sheets, rubbing, rubbing, before father's body began to appear. Through it all, he was silent. By the time dawn came and the sky clouded up, he was breathing only in gasps. One of the boys had gone off on horseback to fetch Mr. Lawrence, the apothecary. So somebody who would make uh, remedies or compounds to help you of natural substances. But when he arrived hours afterward, (gasps) father was dead. Oh no, her dad died. He was buried two days later in the cemetery at Mock's Corner and I returned to the Jessup's. Her brother's gone and now her dad died? Oh. A week later by myself, I went back to the farm. The little shed where father had kept his tools not burned for some reason, but the rest, the house and barn and milking shed and sty were all in ashes. The old horse, the pigs. Oh no, I'm to 43. Oh no, bear with me. Um, oh darn, darn. I thought I had this up. Oh, come on. Darn it. Well. You'll just have to bear with me. Oh, and I already have this up. Let's go here again. Revolutionary War novels. Oh, I bet you I can just go here and go back. I apologize, you guys. Darn it. Her dad just died. Can we go back, please? Thank you. Sarah Bishop. And we were on page 43, so we want to find one that starts with page 44. You're going to have to bear with me. 
my computer is loading. Come on. Oh, come on. Goodness sakes. Forty four. Here we go. Thank you for having some patience. So sad. Her dad died at the tar and feathering. Like, whoa. Okay, I gotta get rid of this thing because I can't make this bigger. Usually I have this set up before you come. The two cows and the chickens were gray and shapeless lumps. Oh, I didn't stay long, nor did I try to find the silverware father had hidden. Wherever it was, it most likely was melted down, but I didn't have the strength or the will to look. I stayed with kind Mrs. Jessup for another week. Then I decided to go to the Lion and Lamb where Chad had helped out in the kitchen before he enlisted and asked for work. It was two miles west of the Jessup place near the East River. The boys got out the wagon to give me a lift along the road and Mrs. Jessup packed me something to eat. She also gave me a Bible. I have three of the holy books, she said, one for me and two for the boys. You take mine. You'll need it now that you'll be, you'll be alone. She got out her Bible and pressed it on me saying, I find, I find the 27th Psalm very verse five of comfort at times like these for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion in the secret of his tabernacle. Shall he hide me? He shall set me up upon a rock. I thanked her for the Bible and the food and the client and climbed up in the wagon beside the two boys. The day was hot with restless rain clouds moving around. We went slowly up the road toward the lion and lamb. All the clothes I owned were on my back. Let's make this a little smaller. And then we're on to chapter eight. And I think I've done two chapters, so I'm going to stop now. Um, that's a lot to take in. Okay, so let's stop share.